For activist Dorothea Dix, her dream was about to become reality. In 1862, her hospital, her dream project, was built. The Western Pennsylvania Hospital for the Insane at Dixmont was everything that the mental illness activists stood for. As a champion of mental patients' rights, she believed that a cold, dark room wasn't healing. Instead, she decided to build a small paradise outside of Pittsburgh for the mentally ill to heal. This paradise was also self-sustaining with its own post office, farmlands, rail station, barber, dentist, baseball field, and it generated its own power and had its own sewage treatment plant. All this nuzzled against the peaceful banks of the Ohio. She wanted to create a refuge, a sanctuary, an asylum, a place where the mentally ill would be respected and they would get their minds healed without pain and suffering. But how did her dream went so terribly? terribly wrong. Dorothea Dix's vision died on the battlefields of World War I. The hellish landscapes and the constant bombardments of trench warfare broke men's mind. And for the first time, the world truly understand PTSD. Unfortunately, the mental wounds of the war were proving hard to heal, and they brought the mental illness back home with them. Already at max capacity, all these hospitals were forced to accept two to three times the number of patients they were designed to handle. Now every single room in these asylums were filled to the brim with patients laying in beds. After the rooms were filled, the patients started to line the hallways. Then, in 1929, the Great Depression hit. With their population skyrocketing and their revenue nosediving, the hospital had to go into increasingly desperate means to fund their operations, including profiting from employees' work and not paying the staff any wages. By the end of World War II, the hospital was bankrupt, and the state stepped in to buy it. Now stuck with an overcrowded hospital full of war vets with PTSD and the mentally ill, the state of Pennsylvania was seeking cheap and easy solutions to the mental health problem. A savior came in the name of Walter Freeman. He considered the conditions as sane asylums cruel and unusual punishment. To him, a cure to mental illness was to get a patient de-institution, no matter the price, and risk to the patient's safety. So Dr. Freeman streamlined an already controversial treatment with a hammer and an ice pick. He could claim that he can cure mental illness, and anyone can do it. He called his new treatment transorbital lobotomy. With his new ice pick method of transorbital lobotomy, Dr. Freeman traveled from state hospital to state hospital all over the state of Pennsylvania, performing and demonstrating his new techniques. Even though mainstream medicine advised against lobotomies, the ice pick lobotomy was commonplace across the nation with physicians bragging that they could do dozens a day. Without full knowledge of what exactly they were poking at, physicians would conduct the lobotomy on consenting and non-consenting patients with mixed to disastrous side effects. Lobotomies were continued to be practiced in the United States until 1967. By then, the drug Thorazine hit the market. It promised to be the chemical lobotomy without the negative health effects. Thorazine also marked the beginning of the end of the insane asylum system in the United States. I visited the state institutions for the mentally retarded, and I think particularly at Willowbrook that we have a situation that borders on uh, a snake pit, and that the children live in filth, uh, that uh, many of our fellow citizens are suffering tremendously because of lack of attention, lack of, lack of imagination, lack of uh, adequate manpower. Throughout the 70s and 80s, the deinstitutionalized movement swept across the nation. Fueled by news reports of the terrible conditions inside them, mixed with the increasing cost of running the asylums, one by one they started to be shut down. With a new law passed preventing state hospitals from making money from their patients' work, the writing was on Dixmont's wall. By 1984, Dixmont closed its doors for the last time and the final 300 patients were moved to different institutions. Some local hospitals put bids on the buildings, but all the deals fell through. For the next few decades, the buildings lied abandoned, but they weren't empty. Like any other asylum where horrible things happened, they quickly gained a reputation of being extremely haunted. 
Locals came to fear the location and its reputation, but that didn't stop people from all over the nation running around the abandoned asylum braving its underground tunnel network to try to experience the unknown. All this continued to the early 2000s when everything changed. Gray skies are gonna clear up, put on a happy face, brush off the clouds and cheer up. Or naked and smeared with their own feces, they were making a pitiful sound, a kind of mournful wail that it's impossible for me to forget. Guards were brutal and treatment was non-existent. Dixmont Hospital for the Insane. Uh, many of our fellow citizens are suffering tremendously. And shortly after transorbital lobotomy. That its disordered parts would simply be jolted back into place. It's not all that different from striking a television set in the hope of restoring the picture. In 2005, the state of Pennsylvania sold Dixmont to Walmart in hopes of building a super center right beside the highway. Work on demolition started right away, with the surviving medical equipment being auctioned off. By the end of 2005, the entire complex was leveled. Now the location of the world's most haunted insane asylum, according to some, where thousands of patients suffered and died, is going to become an all-in-one shopping center for the whole family to enjoy. But the world's most haunted Walmart wasn't meant to be, as Dixmont still had a few tricks up its sleeve. There are those who wonder if the ghosts of Dixmont are afoot. After removing the foundation of Dixmont State Hospital, the hill started to slide. With the entire mountain slowly sliding down towards the Ohio River, Walmart quickly abandoned the site. Though the cause of the sudden unstable list was never discovered, many locals claimed it was the ghosts themselves. No matter what actually caused the sliding, what remains now is just an abandoned, empty, grassy field surrounded by barbed wire that no one's allowed into. This is where we pick up the story. Ever since its demolition, no one was allowed to investigate where this scene asylum once was. But everything's not lost. Just above where the asylum once stood, there's the cemetery where the patients who have died are buried at. Lucky for us, the cemetery still stands, so we're going to do an in-depth investigation of the cemetery to see if the ghosts of Dick's monster are still kicking. Um, it's not marked on any map, so it's going to be quite difficult to uh, find it. After a bit of searching, Reddy and I were able to find the cemetery. There they are. On our first row. Look, what is that? Those are the graves. Each one of these marks a body. With the weather getting worse every minute, we quickly set up camp and began our investigation. We decided to carry light, bringing only a millimeter, an EMF meter, and our camera. It didn't take long for the spirits to notice. During our briefing, our millimeter started to go off. You just been there and it got a signal. You want to just up? What did, it, what did it do? Like, what number went one. up? A one? Yeah. That could be a possibility. You just turned that on. Okay. Is there anybody here? You turned it on. <laughs> wow. I didn't expect that result. When I asked, was there anyone there? The EMF on the millimeter went off again. The investigation didn't even start, and we were already getting great results. Oh, yeah, they are veterans. Tell me if anything happens there. What? Was that you? I heard two taps. Boom, boom. Did you hear that? No. It's like up towards that way. After recording paranormal activity at our base camp, we decided to explore the rest of the cemetery. What did they do? What 
happen. I don't know, like, it was swinging around, but it's not changing, but it suddenly changed just for a second. Reddy captured more EMF activity on the second meter. He didn't stray far from base camp. We were less than 12 minutes into our investigation. Already we were experiencing unusually high EMF activity all around the base camp. EMF stands for electric magnetic fields. Most ghost investigators believe that ghosts can at least influence, if not our, electric magnetic energy. With the high rate that our EMF meters are pinging, we believe that we are not alone. We decided to continue to investigate the cemetery. It does look like it just goes on and on and on, doesn't it? It's a lot of bodies. Yeah. It has to suck. Anyways, let's put it on your grave. Just a random grave. Lobotomize. When we asked where you lobotomize, we got a response saying, yeah. Not only it's interesting because it's an intelligent response to our question, but also according to the history of the cemetery, everyone who's buried here was buried before 1936, which was before the lobotomies began. The spirit who responded to our question isn't buried in the cemetery, but instead came from the original Dixmont State Hospital haunted grounds before it was demolished. See that? <laughs> I'm warming them up right now. Which is why I gave you the camera. I can. Careful, Freddy reached down to adjust the mel meter. We captured this creepy EVP. We have no idea who said it, but it doesn't sound whoever said it was pleasant. Despite our best attempts, we were unable to tell what exactly it was saying. What's also interesting is despite how loud it was in the recording, we were unable to hear it on location. It was only by reviewing the evidence we were able to pick it up. So we can't make heads or tails with it, or determine what it's saying. We'll let you decide in the comments. Be careful. Be careful. Be careful. While we were recording lines for this episode, Reddy said he saw so a figure we'll in the see woods. If there's anything that left to haunt. Let's see if the ghosts are here. There's something there. Is there? Is there something there? It's right there inside. Where? Something there. Do you think so? Like, I'm flashing light there. So. I can't see where you're flashing. Those trees. You want to investigate it? Anything else? What do you see? They saw. What? Uh, yeah. We'll review the footage. See if you caught it. Always point the camera where you're looking. It's a great. Right rule of advice. Oh god, I blinded myself. <laughs> Ooh, those LEDs are bright. While we were unable to find the figure, we were able to record this strange EVP while it was blinded by the camera's light. <laughs> to me, it sounded like a muffled scream. Could it be perhaps one of the patients who suffered here? Um, you want to go further deeper into the woods? 
Uh, I can just stand here. I'm kind of scared. Okay. Taking the page out of the horror movie rulebook, I decided it was time to split up. I decided to take a trek deeper into the woods while my partner, Reddy, stayed behind at base camp. Now more than a couple football fields away from my partner, this real sense of isolation and dread started to seep in. I hate to sound cliche, but I definitely feel like I wasn't alone. I'm 71, are you there? While deep in the woods, alone, at Dixmont Cemetery, I captured this strange, shrill voice. What the hell was that? While investigating that mysterious sound, we capture another EVP. This one more high-pitched and feminine. Though it's unclear what she is saying, it sounds a lot like not today or something like that. No spiking here. If you're here, speak up. Oh shit. Give me a sign. Give me a proof that you exist, that you won't be forgotten. Come on. I captured this EMF spike. I tried to replicate it by movement, thinking it could be interference from that, but I was unable to replicate it, leaving credence that it could be paranormal. With clear signs of paranormal activity, I decided to head back to base camp, grab the mail meter, and go back to the location to conduct a more in-depth investigation. Now, 30 minutes after I first heard it, I heard the loud pitch squeal again. <sighs> You're gonna have to speak loud. Now you guys deserve this. None of you did. We captured the clearest EVP we ever recorded. The mysterious voice that we captured clearly says, is it perfect? Is this the voice of one of the patients who died and was buried here? I continued to investigate the spot for 10 more minutes without finding any more evidence. With the weather getting worse and colder, we decided it was time to head home and review the evidence that we have oh, captured. During the course of our investigation, we have recorded multiple EMF spikes and EVPs recorded. We also saw shadowy figures, but we were unable to capture them on tape. But for us, the EVPs really took the cake.
Multiple times we captured your clear and concise EVPs. It's rare to capture one of these EVPs, let alone multiple of them. This really lends into the credibility of the reputation of this place. So important to note that one of our questions got an intelligent response. When we asked, were you lobotomized, a spirit responded with yes. Given the historical context of this location and the fact that everybody buried in a cemetery died before the lobotomies began, means that spirits from the original Dixmont site are also haunting the cemetery as well. There is no doubt to us that even after its demolition, Dixmont remains very haunted, and I would suggest any ghost hunter in the region to check it out. Asylums, like the word definition, was meant to be a refuge and sanctuary for those who were sick, but it became a warehouse for the forgotten. And as seen at the cemetery at Dixmont, they were also forgotten at death. But the spirits of Dixmont are no longer quiet.